Next up, we pivot to the heart of any business, customer service. In our next panel discussion titled, The Art of Customer Service, Lessons Learned from Retail, we'll uncover the secrets behind exceptional service experiences. Prepare for insights that transform challenges into unparalleled customer loyalty. Let's give it up for our esteemed moderator, Emily Hagen, Senior Vice President, Marketing and Advertising Insights at CMI, and our panelists as they join us. Let's give them a round of applause. Okay. Yes. All right. Wait for everyone. All right. Well, greetings, everyone, and a warm welcome to our discussion today. Vegas day three. So I'm glad to see some faces in the audience. Like I say, I was a little concerned that we weren't going to have anyone in chairs mm -hmm. after two nights in Sin City. Um, but great to have you guys here today. Um, we're going to talk about kind of nuances, strategies, principles that really underpin exceptional customer service. As everyone in this room knows that customer service isn't just a business transaction, right? Um, it's an art form. It takes finesse, it takes empathy, and really a deep understanding of human behavior. So today what we want to talk about are some tools and techniques that we have found to be successful in our everyday um, that truly really help us kind of turn just ordinary interactions into exceptional moments. And so I've had the pleasure of getting to know these great people up on the stage with me over the past two weeks. Um, I'll introduce myself first. I'm Emily Hagen. I work for CMI out of the great city of Atlanta, and we are a market research and data analytics firm. And really what that means is we talk to people. We talk to people to understand their behaviors, their beliefs, their opinions, why they do the things that we do um, to help our clients really, you know, answer burning business questions and really pivot themselves for growth. So, Steve, you want to go next? Yeah. Hi, I'm Steve Morbitzer. I'm former vice president of a home warranty company, which is where my experience comes from. Um, the home warranty industry is, is the center of a lot of conflict. Uh, it, was, it was my job for over 15 years to be the go-between between what was benefiting the customer and also the limitations that they had to undergo to do this. It was, it was an awful lot, of, awful lot of work, a lot of, lot of classes, a lot of reading, but it's something I would like to bring to everybody. Hi, my name is Angela Moody. I'm with the Michael Cook Group. Um, I'm a senior pro uh, program manager. <laughs> Sorry, I thought you were laughing at me. Oh. <laughs> no, never. <laughs> so I'm a senior program manager. I bring about two decades of experience in project management. I've had the privilege of working with industry leaders like Samsung, Apple, Stella McCartney. Um, I led the workplace strategy and development for Samsung for about seven years. Um, and then I crossed over on the retail side and worked with Apple and um, Phil, uh, Phil McCartney, Phil Coffey. And I'm glad here to be here with you guys and share my insights on customer service. Hi, everybody. My name is Megan Criley McKay, and I'm a leading subject matter expert at human intelligence and former certified interrogator with the Department of Defense. My brand is the Soft Interrogator, and I do one on one coaching and retreat intensive for C-suite executives worldwide in all industries focused on the human intelligence language and really turning customer service into a human experience. All right, so we're going to kind of use the words customer service and client service interchangeably because a lot of the work that we do is project-based. So I just kind of want to clear the air and set this tone there. So let's kind of roll. First question, how do you define exceptional customer service when it comes to servicing clients? Um, and I can tell you, in my experience, it really kind of comes down to three things. One, reliability. Am I doing what I say I'm going to do? Am I having follow through with my clients? Can they rely on me, right? Um, the second is proactivity. Am I able to anticipate my clients' needs? They've got a million things that they're doing, a million, you know, balls they're juggling in the air, and we all know that time is the greatest resource. So am I able to anticipate what they're going to need before they're going to need it? that I can kind of take that worry off of their plate. And then the third is transparency. Am I clearly communicating what's happening on an ongoing basis, whether that's good or bad, hopefully good. Um, and one example of one thing that we've instituted at CMI, and this isn't rocket science, but you'd be amazed as to how, you know, sometimes these things get overlooked, is we do Monday morning emails. So we put together what happened last week, what's happening this week, 
What are the barriers that we're encountering? And then are there any kind of questions that we need our clients to answer? They go out every Monday morning so our clients know what to expect. We are able to get that information back. And again, it's that consistency and reliability that we have found to really, truly deliver excellent customer service. So Steve, what about you? Excellent customer service starts with, what a lot of people don't understand when I'm coaching people, they do not realize, and you'd be shocked, this will clear up easily a third to half of your problems. The person who's standing in front of you at the counter or on the phone needs Something. You, you sell business to business, and I think everybody here sells business to business. We were business to the general public. We sold to the general public, so we had people who had no idea what, what we did coming to us and needing help. One of the things that causes um, an annoyance, frustration, is somebody who has a problem they can't solve on their own. So they're coming to you. Once you understand this person is coming to you, and it could be something as simple as, I need a shirt. I need some plumbing work, or I need medical attention. They are under stress. Once you understand that person needs me, and you shouldn't be calm, you should actually be a little bit keyed up when you're engaging a customer, because these customers, they may look calm, they're not. Do I have time for a little story? Yeah, keep going. A little, little story <laughs> that just speaks volumes. It was the, understand this was a home warranty company, and I got... All, all of the irate customers were elevated to me, and I, I honestly I wouldn't have it any other way. They, I had, it was the end of the day, we were about to go home, and I had a gentleman saying, uh, with, a, with a problem with his, with his downstairs bathroom. And he, he said, uh, yeah, I need this fixed today. I, I said, well, that would be overtime. And he was getting pretty irate, and I was offering options, uh, which, which was working. It was calming him down, and then he because I showed that he actually had a number of bathrooms in the house and it wasn't really worth the overtime. And so calmed him down uh, using some strategies. And he finally said, listen, my wife and I are both disabled. I can only, we can only use this one bathroom. I'm here to tell you I paid the overtime. We okayed the overtime. He, being the demographic he was, okay, an older man, really didn't, didn't want to tell anybody that he was disabled him and his wife were disabled. So he was coming to me with a pretty important problem. Um, and, but that strategy works for the guy that does need a shirt. Okay, they're, 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 you don't know what kind of stress somebody is under. So that, to me, is making sure you know who the customer is. The customer is somebody who needs you. Well, and it sounds like you made a really good first impression, right? Which kind of leads me into my second question, which is what does make a good first impression and then what makes a bad first impression? So, Angela, kick it off to you. Okay, well, first, First impressions are very, very important, and I think it is professionalism. It is how you dress and, and look the part. I think it's also um, what what I found to be successful on on uh, first impressions is listening. Are you a good listener? Are you attentive? Are you listening to their pain points? Um, bad impression, being late. You know, don't ever be late on the first date. <laughs> yeah, and so that's those are keys. For me, you know, being on time, um, and that's all I have. Yeah. yeah. Megan, awesome. So I got to ask the crowd, how many times you get to make a great first impression? Give it to me. Give it to me. <laughs> you got one time. You got one time only. So you got to be thinking about it 24/7. Back to the wonderful keynote prior to us. Who are you? And what are you bringing in that moment in time to the people you're going to connect with every day, all day? 24-7. A first impression is actually pretty complex. And I'll just give you a short bite because that's what this is. Yeah, we got time. Is step back and look at the space around you. Because not only the energy of the space, the temperature of the space, and the look of the space is going to be how you start your approach. I'm talking interrogation type stuff. Human intelligence, reading the room. As that human being approaches you, if it's in person, because it could be virtual, it could be audio, it could be text, it could be email. But what is your frame of mind? Because it starts with self. And if you're having a bad day, you didn't sleep well, you drank too much wine in Vegas, how's that going to determine your interaction? Because that's setting the pace, step one, as you start to engage. So when you talk about making first impression, do a self-check. 
and there's some training that could complement all of what we do in coaching to help people as leaders remind themselves, oh my gosh, I'm not doing that regularly. That is step one. Step two, as you start to begin the engagement, you're going to assess the individual in front of you. And depending upon what state of being they are in, negative to positive, changes your approach and how you can meet them where they are and truly see what they need, not necessarily what they're asking for. And the conversation and the first impression is great. What about a bad person? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so raise your hand if you feel like you have ever made a bad first impression. Yeah. Everybody. So, yeah. <laughs> Lots of examples yeah. out there, right? You didn't read it right. You weren't prepared. One of the things that I'm going to give major kudos to Emily and this amazing team is as soon as we were found out we were on this panel together, together from four different locations nationwide, we immediately connected. We scheduled a virtual meeting, and we have had three different conversations, and we met for breakfast this morning. We went through all of our converse questions, yeah. edited them two or three times, yep. and said, okay, how are we going to deliver this? So we're going to nail it and hopefully make a great first impression with you today. Mm -hmm. My point is, we prepared so that we would avoid a bad first impression. Well, I hope that we like each other. And we okay. like each other. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, awesome. Um, let's keep moving because we've got a lot to go through. So how do you build strong relationships with your clients? Do you want to go first? No. No. Honestly, I love it, girl. Go first. What? you want me to go first? No. Okay, I'll go first. Okay. Um, I wasn't expecting that answer. Um, but personability for me kind of reigns true, right? Like, am I someone that you want to actually work with? I always try to come to my clients with a smile, with a good mood, you know, kind of deep breath, make a connection is something that I always really try to remember. Um, you know, we tend to want to go really deep with our clients, and sometimes it's just honestly like forming a friendship with them, right? It's not just when we start a meeting, diving straight into the content. It's how was your weekend? If they were on vacation, how was your vacation? It's getting to know maybe their kids' names. So the amount that they're allowing you to open up to them. Um, but it's really trying to build that personable relationship so that they're willing to come to you and they're willing to open up to you even more and they're willing to give you access to their internal teams. You know, you're really trying to form a very personable relationship with them. Um, the second thing would be active listening. You know, people want to be heard. When they walk away from a conversation, they want to feel like you actually heard what they had to say and that you understood the ask and that they, again, going back to that reliability, that they can rely on you to actually deliver, right? So, Angela, now back to you. <laughs> Great. Now it's me. Um, and I heard it out there. It's honesty. Um, I, I found that to be the most important thing, being authentic. Uh, be yourself right? And you build that trust. You take ownership. I think ownership is key. It's lacking. A lot of folks will fall into the fear of, I don't want to get in trouble. I don't want to um, get them in trouble. I think honesty and ownership is key to building that relationship with your client or customer. And I'd like to compliment, if that's okay. Yeah, I love compliments. So, yeah, <laughs> number one, um, that honesty factor. Yeah is having humility within self. And when, I, when many people say honesty, that means being honest with each other. Right. I'm going to back it up a notch. It starts with being honest with yourself. And bad impression, full loop. When we reached out together, I jumped on it and said, hey, let's get a scheduled virtual. Let's get the ball rolling. We scheduled the date. And then literally 10 minutes before that virtual time and space, electricity went out in my block. <laughs> we thought she just set us up. Yeah. yeah. We thought we were ghosted. We thought, no, we thought we thought we ghosted us, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. And then it took two hours, I guess. The grid was down. There were things that were crazy. It was just happening, and everything happens at once. And so, you know, the next hours later, I'm back on, and I immediately, back to that honesty component. Right. How do you change that bad impression? I immediately said, I apologize. This is what happened. Emily picked the ball up, and I said, thank you. And this is where you can build from within to out really that honesty component that customer service makes it last forever. Yeah. Right. And we forgave her. Yeah, we did. 
We let her, we let her back into the group. Although someone did actually ghost us. There was supposed to be. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm counting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, Steve, anything you want to add? or? Uh, well, taking ownership, as been said before, so important. I was just relating uh, to, to my colleagues up here that um, one of the hardest things to deal with when, when we, before I retired and, and started this was people casting blame. When ke- people cast blame, it, it widens the problem because then they go to that person, that person, that person. The phrase, the phrase I used was, well, this should have been checked. That other person should have done this. In reality, regardless of what somebody did before you, and you really don't know, you weren't there, but there was somebody there before you, um, take ownership of the problem. Again, that person's coming to you for help, and there's a problem. It's now your problem. Be a superhero and fix that problem, because if somebody did get there before you, that person has just been let down by person A or B and and gotten to see. So taking ownership of that problem and once you see it, and forget about the casting blame, forget about what somebody should have done or what somebody should have checked. Uh, that, that, that was so hard to, to get out of people's vocabulary. Most of the training I, I did was, before I started Turning Points, was to contractors, and, which is very complex. I don't know if anybody's ever seen the inside of an air conditioner or a furnace. It's very complex. It's easy to miss something. Uh, However, when the contractor would blame the other person, that problem expanded. Then you had to call people. Then people needed to be, take responsibility. But no, when the tech went out there and just fixed the problem and goodbye, you were a hero. All right. Let's turn to conflict. So when conflict enters the picture, what are some strategies that you employ to handle difficult or irate clients? We've all been there. We've all had them. How do you diffuse? So, do you have a, go back to you? For, for, because I've been doing this so long and because I did have, the people who are on my phone were at the highest level of rage because they, they weren't getting resolution. They weren't getting resolution. So, through a lot of study, there we, we focus on four levels of anger and how to back them down. First, keep a level head. Keep a level head. There are YouTube videos all over of people screaming at each other and then somebody else has to get involved. Keep a level head right after that. And I, I think I'm stealing your thunder, the very <laughs> most important thing. Go for it. Um, empathize. Empathy is the key to building trust. Uh, Megan and I were talking and we, um, I made note of a book I'd read, Stalling for Time, Gary Nosner former FBI hostage negotiator, then he said, empathize. When you have empathy, that opens the door to trust. And if you need further proof of the power of empathy, Bernie Madoff, Bernie Madoff perpetrated the biggest Ponzi scheme in the history of the world. And when you read any of the number of books about what he did and how, he started out with empathy. His victims felt like they were a part of his world. He golfed the same golf courses, ate at the same restaurants, vacationed at the same beach. Did he? You don't know. You don't have to be sincere when somebody's screaming at you over the phone. Your job is to get that person a resolution. Words like, I'm here for you. Let's work this out for you. Nobody wants to be in that situation. Phrases like that, it's a magic bullet. That's your silver bullet to get the person down to a reasonable level. And after that, there are a number of strategies that go over deflection, um, offering options. One of my favorite ones is, is the most easy one to point out, threat of punishment by a higher power. Somebody else is going to come in and do what you want, but somebody else is going to come in and, and take over. Megan, that's on you. Conflict. Her favorite topic. How many of you like conflict? So my marine right there. Oh, there's more hands than I thought. So every human is programmed. That's the truth. From the moment you're born, 
You are programmed into a genetic code. Irish, Scottish, I can't change it. You're then early stages of life. Neurological science is proving today from about zero to young 20s for women, older 20s for men. Your neurological abilities and as you go through puberty, everyone experiences some kind of emotional trauma, physical trauma, sexual trauma, and so on. In those early stages of childhood development through your teens and early 20s, you instinctively respond based on fear. It's our code. It's our program. In those moments of trauma, as she was highlighting in the keynote right before us, which was absolutely amazing, you look back and I ask you, go back to that moment right now. Did you move forward into it and want to fight? Or did you free and go into shock? Or did you flee? Fight, flight, or freeze response. It's our natural design to always protect self in some way, shape, or form. And it is instinctive. The dilemma when it comes to conflict is as we evolve into our 20s, which science and neurology is finding today and neuroscience and so much more, is that if we survive that moment, which we're all here to say we did, we continue to use that same response moving forward. The problem is that trauma is carried with you and over time can build and build. And historically, we have a society and a language that forces us to keep it internal or fight it out or drink it, drink it away. But the reality is it never goes away. It's part of you until you cognitively, in your mid to late 20s, can start to look at the outside world and that asking for help and saying, I have a mental health issue. I'm an alcoholic. The root of your trauma is what causes your internal conflict that you project when triggered. And a great example of what Steve and I witnessed last night. Steve came in. He said, let's meet in front of the restaurants downstairs. Let's figure out where we're going to eat. We approached Luger's, the steakhouse, I believe. And right there, the hostess is getting aggressively spoken to by a young Caucasian male in about his early 30s with two women by his side. It then briefly starts to escalate, and he starts to shake and be the mammal he truly is. In that moment, she started to back away and hopefully go ask for help. Steve and I looked at each other, check, check, and Steve said, let's move away and avoid and I then started to lean in. <laughs> I'm Irish and drink. <laughs> My point of that is when conflict happens, look around and assess self first. Are you part of it? Are you instigating it? And how are you responding? That's the beginning of dealing with conflict. Ask yourself why you're responding in that way. And is it the best reason for you to move forward, avoid, or solve a problem. Steve chose, not our battle tonight, but step away and move forward. Me and my role and my training led me to want to step closer to the space, more as a female, in neutral, compassionate, empathetic mode, which I have learned for me helps bring the escalation down. So I can move into a space, look them in the eye and say, how can I help you? Because the reality of conflict is it a projection of who we are. And if we're not getting what we want, we're going to do our darndest to get it in any way, shape, or form. Because that's what I need now. But the truth is it's rooted in your childhood. And what he's doing is screaming, I need help. Think about it from the two perspectives. Because how you respond to conflict is important, and how you confront it, especially when you're dealing with customers, is recognizing you are not in their shoes and you have no idea what's triggering it. Don't assume, and we know what assume stands for, approach with empathy, kindness, and compassion, or ask for help. Can I have something? Yeah, please. Okay. So important. What? 
Megan just said. You saw how it builds and builds and builds. And I was talking earlier about the four levels of anger. Okay, understand when people don't get resolution, they will go through all four. Period, end of story. They used to teach doing this. Try to recognize their personality type and address it like that. Personality typing is under fire, Myers-Briggs. Um, it's kind of under fire right now. It's First of all, it's hard in the limited time you have with a consumer. Uh, second of all, depending on what time of day it is, they score differently on all of those personality type tests. However, everybody will go, for, go through all four stages, and they will end up curious if they don't get resolution. Uh, one trick is... Um, if you don't know, because people put a strong face on, if you don't know what level of anger they're at, jump right in and act like they're furious. Give the, you know, emphasize, give those, give those de-escalation strategies a shot because it, it, you know, your personality type may dictate how quickly you transition from one to the other, but, oh, you're going to go through, oh, oh, a, a stoop, a stoop. Okay. Everybody, nobody's immune. Absolutely, nobody's immune. Once stress hits, you start losing logic, and that's when the fun begins. Yeah, all good points. All right, but let's keep moving. we got two more questions to get through, and this next one's a good big one. Um, we've heard a lot about AI over the past few days and kind of digital innovation. So the question is, AI, automation, and other digital technologies are playing a bigger and bigger role um, in the way that we service our clients today. What are your thoughts on this? And then what are some of the tools and resources that you guys are using to help service your clients through, through these techniques? Um, so, Angela, I'm going to go first. I knew you. <laughs> you can tell me no again if you want. <laughs> no, actually, you can't. You already used that one. Um, yeah, we, we all know about chat, GPT. And um, I think that we um, are either afraid to use it because we think it's, you know, um, plagiarism or, or whatnot, but I think it can be a tool, a very useful to, tool to really um, check your tone when you're talking to a, a, a client, especially when we're talking about conflict and irate, you know, customers. If they're already irate, your tone and how you respond to that email is crucial, right? That's either going to de-escalate or it's going to escalate. And so I find that, you know, uh, chat GBT is, is, is a really good tool to actually, you know, of course, you would go ahead and write your email, but it's a good opinion to check in and, and check. How does my tone sound? You know, does it sound right? Are they going to receive it well? Um, I don't think it's a tool where you are heavily reliant on it. Again, it's just a tool to fact check and, and, and check your temperament on, on how you sound. Are you getting angry yourself? Um, so, yeah, that's one. Another um, common thing that I'm seeing more and more is there's no agenda when you're coming into a meeting these days. Um, where uh, time is of the essence, everyone's time is important, so sometimes we rush to book a time to meet, but then you're coming into the room with zero agenda. Um, well, guess what? That can help you as well. It can kind of put your thoughts together. It can be a template point if you're running out of time to use that tool to say, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk on... X, Y, Z, and I would like to for you to formulate an agenda for me. And from there, you work through that agenda and say what topics work for the meeting that I'm about to hold. So those are the two things, two things that I use AI for. Awesome. Megan, where are you going next? Yeah, so big conversation. And this is the space that I'm trying to really uh, be a voice. Um, as the augmented age of the augmented workforce is what they're calling where we are now and automation and artificial intelligence, and the IQ is increasing. Elon Musk stated, I think, sometime last week that by 2029, the IQ of AI will surpass all of humanity's IQ. Well, what does that mean? It can be scary and fear-based and doomsday, but the reality is, is it's here, and we humans created it. So the voice that I'm trying to bring to this conversation is, Instead of talking about humans as a resource or capital or an asset, the old way of HR speak, we need to raise humanity up and use human intelligence in an artificially intelligent workforce as the conversation. And here's why. There are ways for us to change our programs 
And I know that quantum abilities and leadership styles, which was mentioned yesterday, and what we're learning in science, humanity and our capability as humans is so much greater. There's data out that says we only use 10% of our capabilities in our brain. I think it's less than that. I think we can change that trajectory through some of the knowledge and tools that I and you and others are starting to understand and bring into that space. But in an artificially intelligent world, we cannot fight it. It is what it is, and it's moving at a very fast pace. We need to invest in humans and remove the culture of saying, what do you do? How are you? But more like, tell me your story. What do you love to do? What inspires you? What motivates you? Irrelevant of what we see, age, gender, race, and color but who are you inside out? And let's bring it so that we can all shine together and be a higher level of intelligence ourselves, working alongside the machines we have created to, I believe, truly 100 years from now, save humanity. We've got to do it together. Yeah, couldn't say more. Right, Steve, you're up. Actually, I think these tools, they're brand new tools, and I think it'll all smooth out. Uh, there, are, there are some hiccups, like when you're trying to, to chat with, uh, with an AI, presence, let's call it. It gets rough. I find myself typing representative agent, instead of screaming agent. it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and that, that has been working. But the tools are there. They're not going anywhere. And I think it will smooth out. We will we'll learn how to use these tools. All right. So before we go to questions, let's kind of end with what's the most important thing organizations need to do to deliver exceptional client service? And I'll kind of kick it off and then I'll hand it over to my peers. Um, for me, it's really promoting a client-centric, you know, organization and culture, right? It's empowering your team members to be able to meet the needs of their clients and, you know, whatever that needs to happen. It's really, it starts from the leadership position and it kind of trickles down. So making sure that the client is at the center of every decision being made, you know, how is this going to affect the client, how is it going to affect, you know, their business is really, truly, truly important. Um, so, Megan, why don't we go next? I won't pick up Angela again. Yeah. yeah. Let's go right down. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we'll go right down. Yeah. So, I think uh, what you just said is where, is where it starts. It starts at the top. Yeah. People say when you talk customer service, it's about the customer. Uh-uh. That's the end result. It starts with the team. It starts with the culture, from leadership all the way to the janitor and the AI programmer in between. Because the reality is, is are you a customer of your own service? Are you a customer of your own product? People who work for utility companies, they get electricity at home. So put yourself in that space where I am the customer as well. Do I use our services? Do I use our product? And are you proud of it? And if not, be the voice that can make it better for customers. And as you do that internally and then start to work through what your customers' pain points are and their issues, then all of a sudden customer service escalates to a wonderful, wonderful thing. And you aren't getting people and dealing with conflict. You're building referral and longevity and loyalty to your brand. I think that's where we need to work together. And that's the evolution with all these wonderful five generations of them speaking up and using their voice because you got to look at like you're the customer. And if you're asking for what you need, hopefully that will help those that are coming to you. So the most important thing for me um, or that I believe is most important is, is, is expectation, understanding what the client's expectation is. I think that is crucial. Um, like I said earlier, uh, listening, understanding their pain points, truly listening and understanding their pain points. Sometimes, sometimes we get caught up with we know how to provide the solution, so we're not listening. We have our own method and we force it down their throat. So I think not all, uh, you know, not, there's not one approach when you, when you meet with a client and you're trying to listen and, and resolve their situation. So I think the biggest thing is really expectation. What is their expectation and, and, and listening? So. Yep. Benefits. Talk about benefits. Yep. So how can I help you? How can I benefit you? And it's, it's starts before you actually talk to the customer. It's understanding your product, understanding what you can do, your 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 place in the marketplace. Yep. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. I guess I'll open it up to questions. Does anybody have a question from the audience? Or day three? I know. <laughs> <laughs> 
Because she would tell you no. Oh, yeah. She would tell you no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, awesome. Well, thank you for your time today. Thank you for listening. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Yes. Thank and you, again, questions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Good job to everybody. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay.